Matthew 11, verses 1 and 2, the Bible says, Now when John the Baptist heard in prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples to Jesus, and they said unto him, Are, he is the, are you the one that should come, or do we look for another? In these days when we are killing ourselves, trying to live and work harder for less than we have ever done before, who spend our whole lives and lose all of our health in the pursuit to accumulate wealth, only to turn around and spend all of our wealth to restore our health and to stay alive, who seek to avoid the torment of the daily stresses, constraints, and obligations of life, by escaping into the darkness of alcohol, drug abuse, sexual pleasures, binge spending, or any other sort of replacement personal gratification, who spend their time with their face planted in a phone, a computer, or a television, and then one, then one day wonder why they have no friends left at the end of their lives. When our life begins, we are rocked in the cradle and under the folding of our hands in the casket at the end of life, there is always something going on. But I have come to you today to say I know where a poor man has a chance, where the troubled man can find peace, where the lost man can find hope, where a sick man can get well and an ignorant man can be made wise where a bad man could be made good, where a good man could be made better, where men dead in darkness can find the light of life, where the addicted can find freedom from their imprisonment, and the dead man could be made alive. It's our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, the wonderful Son of the living God, who came down the stairway of heaven and was born in a manger in Bethlehem, who was hid in Egypt, brought up and raised in Nazareth, baptized with the sinners in the Jordan River, tempted in the wilderness like a common man, affirmed his ministries with miracles by the roadside, and he healed multitudes without medicine, and he made no charges for his service or the hearing of his words. He paid a debt he didn't know because we had a debt we could never repay. He conquered everything that came against him, every principality, every power, every evil man, and even death itself. And then he turns to us in Matthew 16, verses 13 through 15, when it says, When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say thou art John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But he said unto them, But who do you say that I am? And that's my question to you. Who do you say that he is today? Is he the one? Or do we look for another? Do we look into the doctrine of Mohammed? Do we look into the doctrine of Confucius? Do we look into the doctrine of all of the other religions that claim either a pathway to God or they are God? Or should we consider the Son of the living God, Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, who suffered and sacrificed and was resurrected from the dead? In Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 5, the Bible says, In Saul, or the Apostle Paul, yet breathing out threatening and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and desired of them letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any that took the name of Christ, whether they be men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus. And suddenly there's a light shined about him, and he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? Who are you, Lord? Every human being in this world or in the one to come is going to call him Lord. Is going to call him God, the Son of God. He is going to rule and reign he asks us, 
Who do you say that I am? And I'm his spokesman today, and I'm asking you, who do you say that he is? Pastor, how can we know just exactly who is this Jesus that you're preaching about? Who is this Christ, the Son of the living God? Who is this Savior of the world? Who is this that is so polarizing to all men one way or the other? How can someone elicit such love and at the same time such anger, frustration, and even hatred of those who refuse to accept him? How? How can I know the truth and who he is? Well, first of all, let me suggest to you that in the book of John, the beloved disciple, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 14, the Bible says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the only, glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The relationship with Christ and the Scriptures is undeniable. Christ is in all aspects of the Scripture. In every, there, every portion and part and sentence and vowel and syllable, Christ is, Christ is, Christ is. Consider the Bible itself, the 66 books of the Bible, and the role that Christ plays in them. In Genesis, he is introduced as the seed of a woman. In Exodus, he is our Passover lamb. In Leviticus, he becomes our high priest. In Numbers, he is the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night, preserving the Israelites in the wilderness. In Deuteronomy, he is the prophet like unto and spoken of by Moses. In Joshua, he is the commander of the Lord's army. In Judges, he is our judge and lawgiver. In Ruth, he is our kinsman redeemer. In First and Second Samuel, he is the seed of David. In Kings and Chronicles, he is our reigning king. In Ezra, he is our faithful scribe. In Nehemiah, he is the rebuilder of everything broken. In Esther, he is our Mordecai, the advocate with the Father. In Job, he is our ever-living redeemer and the voice in the whirlwind. In the Psalms, he is the shepherd. He is our light and our salvation. He is the strength of our lives. In Proverbs, he is the source of all wisdom. In Ecclesiastes, he is the meaning of our life. In the Song of Solomon, he is the loving bridegroom. In Isaiah, he is the king of kings, the lord of lords, the fairest of 10,000, the lily of the valley, the balm of Gilead, the lifter of our head. He is called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the the everlasting, the Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, and the Prince of Peace. In Jeremiah, he is our weeping prophet. In Ezekiel, he is the glorious Lord that stands in the gap and takes up the hedge for us. In Daniel, he is the fourth man in the fiery furnace and the hand writing on the wall. In Daniel, he is, excuse me, in Hosea, he is the faithful husband. In Joel, he is the outpour of the Holy Spirit. In Amos, he is our burden bearer. In Obadiah, he is our judge and our savior. In Jonah, he is the risen prophet. And Micah, he is the ruler of the world from Bethlehem, the least of Israel. And Nahum, he is our stronghold. And Habakkuk, he is the watchman and the writer of the vision. And Zephaniah, he is the mighty one to save. And Haggai, he is the restorer. And Zechariah, he's the branch of David, the one who was pierced and bruised for us. And Malachi, he is the son of righteousness. In the Gospel of Matthew, he is the king of the Jews the one the prophets foretold of, the promised Messiah, the one called Christ, the Son of the living God. He is the straight gate and the narrow way to God. In the Gospel of Mark, he is the servant and the miracle worker. In the Gospel of Luke, he is the baby in the manger, the Son of Man, the Redeemer of our souls, and the cross-bearer who rent the the veil in twain. In the Gospel of John, he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the resurrection and the life. He is the light of the world. He is the true vine. He is the shepherd, and he is the only door to God. In the book of Acts, he is the resurrected and ascended Lord, the head of the new church, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and the fulfillment of the gospel message. In the book of Romans, he is the justifier of our faith, the source of all hope, and the power of God unto salvation unto all that believe. 
In the book of 1 Corinthians, he is the crucified Christ we preach, the way maker and our resurrector from the dead. In the book of 2 Corinthians, he is our comfort, the one who became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God through him. In the book of Galatians, he is our liberty, who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we could ask or think, whom the whole family of heaven and earth is named. In the book of Ephesians, he is the head of his church, his sacrifice to God for us as, as a sweet savor, and of whom the whole family of heaven and earth is named. In the book of Philippians, he is our joy and the source of our strength and for our provision. In the book of Colossians, he is our completeness and the glue that holds our world together. In the book of First and Second Thessalonians, he is the coming king and judge, revealed from heaven with fiery flames, taking vengeance on them that oppose God. In the books of First and Second Timothy, he is the mediator between God and man. In the book of Titus, he is our blessed hope and glorious appearing, the merciful Savior of men. In the book of Hebrews, he is exalted higher than the angels, the great high priest after the order of Melchizedek, and a greater sacrifice, our perfecter. In the book of James, he is God's perfect wisdom. He is the power behind our faith and the source of all good that comes from above. In first and second Peter, he is our chief shepherd and he is our chief cornerstone. In first, second, and third John, he is our truth and everlasting life. The singular manifestation and display of the true love of God. In Jude, he is the foundation of our faith, our security, and the one who pulls them out of the fire. In Revelation, he is the King of kings, Lord of lords, and the revelation of God that defeats all evil and rules and reigns forever. Jesus Christ is God. Jesus Christ was God, is God, and will always be God by virtue of his sonship, by virtue of his sovereign and divine nature. He transcends all of the created order and defies human intellect and wisdom. Consider his place in all of this as transcendent of our normal living. By virtue of his sovereignty, he transcends all elements of the created order. For example, he transcends all human medicine. He cured the sick, restored sight to the blind, gave hearing to the deaf, gave a voice to the dumb, cast out spirits of affliction, and never administered a single dose of drugs. He transcends the physics of science, he disproved the law of gravity when he physically ascended into heaven. He transcends all business economics. He totally disproved the law of diminishing returns by feeding 5,000 men with two fishes and five loaves at Poseidon. He would then repeat the miracle near Garesians, near the region of the Decapolis, when he fed 4,000 with seven loaves of bread. He transcends human biology because he was born without a natural conception process. He transcends chemi chemical formulation by turning water into wine. He transcends human government because he is called King of Kings and Lord of Lords in heaven and in earth by those who have any idea who he is. He transcends time itself by having no beginning and of his kingdom there shall be no end. He transcends all religion by virtue of becoming its object of worship. No one comes to the Father but by Him. He was resurrected from the dead on the third day, so He even transcends death. He had no servants, yet they called Him Master. He had no degrees, yet they called Him Teacher. He had no medicines, yet they called him healer. He had no army, yet kings and nations fear him. He won no military battles, yet he conquered the world. He committed no crime, yet they crucified him. He was buried in a tomb, but he lives today. Jesus Christ is our pearl from paradise. He is the gem of the glory land. He's truth fairest jewel, and he's time's choicest theme. He is life's strongest cord. He is joy's deepest tide. All he is is light's clearest ray. His name stands as a synonym for free healing, friendly help, and full salvation. 
The blessing of the knowledge of his name is like honey to the taste and is like harmony in the ear. It's the health to your soul, the hope of your heart. It is higher than the heavens of heavens and it's holier than the holy of holies. In his birth is our deliverance. In his life, we have our example. In his cross, we have our redemption. And in his resurrection, we have eternal hope. He is the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He is the keeper of creation and the creator of all. He is the architect of the universe and the manager of all times. He always was, he always is, and he always will be unmoved, unchanged, undefeated, and undone. He was bruised and brought healing. He was pierced and eased our pain. He was persecuted and brought freedom for us. He was killed to bring us to life. He is risen from the dead and brings us the power over death. He reigns as king and brings us peace. The world cannot understand him. The armies have not and cannot ever defeat him. The schools cannot explain him. The leaders and rulers of this world cannot ignore him. Pilate and Herod could not condemn him. The Pharisees could not confuse him. And death in the, death in the grave could not contain him. Nero could not crush him or his message. The Pharaohs, the Caesars, and every time before and since cannot silence him. A cadre of false religions, idols, and the logic and vivid imaginations of evil men will never replace him. Nowhere, anywhere in the world can anyone explain him away. He is light. Love, longevity, and the Lord. He is goodness, kindness, gentleness, and God. He is holy, righteous, mighty, powerful, and pure. His ways are right. His word is eternal. His will is unchanging, and his mind is on us. He is my redeemer. He is my savior. He is my guide. He is my peace. He is my joy. He is my comfort. He is my Lord, and he is the ruler of my life. So what does the scripture say about him? And what does he say in the scripture? In John chapter 1, verse 29, John the Baptist declared, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. In John chapter 6, verse 35, and in verses 48 and 51, he said, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. I am that bread of life. This is the bread which came down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give him is my flesh, which I shall give for the whole world. In John chapter 8, verse 12, he said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. In John chapter 11, verses 25 and 26, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth on me shall never die. In John chapter 10, verses 7 and 10, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are robbers and thieves, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door by me. If any man shall enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find rest. The thief cometh not for to steal, and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. John chapter 10, verses 11 and 14. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for his sheep. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and have known of mine. But the Bible says there is much more to this than just what's in this life. If all we do is trust in Christ in this life, we are of all men most miserable. You do not fully know the Jesus of the Bible until you know Jesus of the book of Revelation. There is a vast difference between the Christ that came down off the cross and was resurrected and the Christ who sits in heaven right now preparing to make his way back to you. And you need to know it because while it is the same God and it is the same 
God manifested as a man, as the Son of God, it's vast different now than it was when he walked the earth. In the book of Matthew, he is the Lamb of God, led to the slaughter, but he opened not his mouth. But in the book of Revelation, he's the lion of the tribe of Judah, and he shouts with a voice of victory, making all things new. In the book of Matthew, he is the first son of Joseph and Mary. But in the book of Revelation, he is the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. He is that alive and was dead, and behold, is alive forevermore, and has the keys of death and of hell. In the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he is hung on a cross between thieves. But in the book of Revelation, he sits at the right hand of the power of God and he holds the seven churches in his hand and walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. In the book of Matthew, he is brought into Jerusalem on a donkey. But in the book of Revelation, he is sitting on a white horse in the clouds of heaven with the armies of heaven, the Old Testament saints, the New Testament saints, and the faithful church. And he is not coming back for his crucifixion, but he's coming back for his coronation on the mount of the temple of King David. In the book of Matthew, he is adorned with a crown of thorns by the Roman temple guards. But in the book of Revelation, he wears crown upon crown upon crown upon crown upon crown for he is King of kings and Lord of lords. In the Gospels, he is dragged before Pilate and Herod. But in the book of Revelation, Pilate and Herod will be dragged before him. Rome could not kill him. The grave could not hold him. The cross could not condemn him. Satan cannot defeat him. He is the mighty God, the everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. He's the Rose of Sharon, the Balm of Gilead, the Lily of the Valley. He's the Lord of Glory, the Light of the Tribe of Judah, and the Light of the World. The graves of all the false gods, men of worship, litter the earth, where the bones of those they believed would live forever. Some to this day still do. Mohammed has a grave and his bones are located in the Green Dome in Medina, Saudi Arabia. Buddha has a grave that is located in Jinshan County, China. Confucius has a grave located in the Cemetery of Confederates in Jinning, China. Joseph Smith is located, grave is located in the Smith Family Cemetery in Nauvoo, Illinois. Charles Darwin, his grave is located in Westminster Abbey in London, England, near the grave of Sir Isaac Newton. All their physical bodies remain embalmed in their graves, but on a street called, on a street called Straight, in the city of Jerusalem, in the borrowed grave of one Joseph of Arimathea, is an empty grave with a sign that hangs high over the door. He is not here. He is risen. He is not here. He is risen. He is not here. He is risen. And he sits at the right hand of the Father in all power and all glory and all majesty and in all might. And it will be this God that will return to the earth and judge men for their sins and rule and reign and show mercy and compassion to those who take his name in spite of difficult circumstances. How do you describe Jesus Christ right now? He is identified in the book of Revelation as he who holds the seven stars in his right hand. He walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. He has a sharp, he, he had the sharp sword with two edges. He who is called the Son of God, whose eyes are like a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass, who had the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. He who is called holy and true, and who has the key of David. He that opens and no man shuts, and shuts and no man opens. He who is called faithful, true, the amen, the beginning of the creation of God. And finally, his appearance described in Revelation 19, 11 through 16. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many crowns. 
And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him on white horses. Who are the armies in heaven? The Old Testament saints, the New Testament saints, and the church of the angelic host and the church of the living God, the true church of the living God. And out of his mouth goes a sharp two-edged sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. So let's circle this back to the beginning. <clears throat> the world is asking the same question that John the Baptist's disciples asked while he was in a prison cell. And I'm asking you this question today. Is he the one? Is he the one for you? I say this with all the love and compassion that I possibly can. He is the one for me. And I have given my life to preach this message and this man and this God to you. There will be many haters. There will be many doubters. There's a bunch of people that all they want to do is argue. But if you will look at this from the bottom of your heart, he is the one that I proclaim to you today. He is the one I put my complete life and trust in. All I have said to this point is to acknowledge this simple point in a singular message. I call him Lord for all he has done for me. I will never be able to thank him enough for the life that he's given me. I call him Lord because he lifts me from all fear. I call him Lord because in him there is hope for the hopeless. I call him Lord because it's his words that lead all men to freedom. I call him Lord because in him I live and move and have my being. I call him Lord because everything that is good in this life is his provisional gift of love. I call him Lord because he gives peace to us in a world that is incapable of providing it. I call him Lord because he is a sight that all men long to see when this life is over. I call him Lord and praise him for all he has done for me, but I worship him because he is Lord of lords and King of kings. He has given all men who have this in their heart a commission from his own mouth. He calls us all to declare him to the world. He gave us the Great Commission, which is the preaching of the gospel. In Matthew 28, 18 through 20, he said, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. In Mark 16, verses 15 through 18, he said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. In my name they shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not harm them. They shall lay their hands on the sick, and they shall recover. In Luke 24, verses 44 through 49, the Bible says, These are the words, meaning Christ, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which are written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then he opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. And he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. And behold, 
I send the promise unto you from the Father, but tarry here in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. <coughs> Excuse me, what does that mean? I'm about to tell you in just a minute. In John chapter 20, verses 20 and 21, he said, Peace be unto you. As my Father sent me, even so I send you. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart out of Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, You have heard of me. For John truly baptized you with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they were therefore come together, they asked of him, Will thou at this time restore the kingdom again to Israel? It is not... He said, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put under his own power. But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received them out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, and said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand, ye staring, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you, so shall come in like manner as you have seen him go to heaven. This ministry was established for this and this purpose only, to provide this message to anyone who wants to hear it. We know that we'll win souls with this message, but we also know that we'll make enemies. But the most important thing we can do is to do this message under the whole anointing of the Holy Spirit and the unction and power of the Spirit of God, confirming our call and proving that what He has spoken to us is true. Darren Godwin and I take this ministry very, very seriously. We are, we are passionate and we believe that God has, still wants this message preached in the world. I don't know what your message is and it's none of my business, but I still believe that there are people saying, is He the one? There is millions of people that will die and go to hell if you do not take up the mantle and preach the Great Commission. You do not have to be a great preacher. You do not have to be a great orator. You do not have to be influential or charismatic. What you do have to be is faithful, and the Holy Spirit will take the rest of it and take care of the rest of it. I'm asking you today, with a tsunami of evil approaching, with war on the horizon, with banks failing everywhere, with uncertainty and morality absolutely flushed down the toilet in this cesspool of personal opinions and subjective morality, that you once again take this eternal truth and carry it and pull as many people out of hell as you possibly can. To those of you who are in darkness, who may be watching this message for the first time or our ministry have been following, I strongly encourage you by the power of the Holy Spirit to consider eternity at this point in your life. Because life is about to become a fleeting thing. There is no question that this world is a hurricane or a volcano waiting to explode. And of course there will be casualties with this. The judgment of all things is about to be at hand. Consider your eternity. There was a day you weren't but there'll never be a day you won't be. You will spend eternity in one of two places. It doesn't matter what the scientist thinks. It doesn't matter what the Hollywood or sports star thinks. It doesn't mean what a news, what a news person thinks. All of that is irrelevant because they're going to be doing the same thing when this is all over with. I'm here to reach those that want to know, is he the one? And my answer to you is yes, he is the one. He is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he died on that cross so that your sins could be forgiven and you could live in eternity with Him, which sounds a whole lot better than anything that's going on in this world. Well, Pastor, what do I need to do? Well, you need to do this. You need to make a commitment to Christ. We have preached this message to elicit a decision for eternity, a full-throated commitment to Christ, beginning with a profession of your sins and the repentance of your sins, and a commitment to follow and obey Jesus Christ in your heart for the rest of your life. A commitment to be obedient and faithful to His leading, the impartation of His Spirit, and the wisdom and knowledge that comes from His Word. All you have to do 
is just give your heart to Christ and make him Lord. All you've got to do is humble yourselves. Turn your visual mechanisms off. Turn your phone off. Turn your computer off. Turn your television off. And stop worrying about what people think about you and give your life to Christ. Give your life to Christ wholly and fully. Well, pastor, I'll lose friends. I said, what kind of friends do you have? What kind of true friends have you have that are going to bail out on you if you give your life to Christ? Not real ones. Self-destructive ones, maybe. But real people understand and know, even if they don't always agree with everything in the Bible, that Jesus Christ did die and was resurrected on the cross for the sins of mankind. That is our message to the world. And I'm asking you today that if you don't know him in this last couple of minutes, that if you do not know him, to consider eternity and consider where you fit in it. Because you're going to spend eternity one place or the other. If you want to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I ask that you bow your, heart, bow your head and your heart with me now. Father, in the name of Jesus. I want to know this Jesus. I want to know the real Jesus. I don't want to know the one they bicker about on the internet. I don't want to know the one who they say they're devoted to but live contrary to. I don't want to know the one that's all things to all people. I want to know the one that died for my sins. I want to know the one I want to spend eternity with. So, Father, I come before that cross and I confess my sins. And in the sight of God and man, I repent of those sins. And I give my life to Christ. And I ask you, with all humility, if he can be Lord of my life, to take my heart, take my soul, to take my thoughts, my feelings, my emotions, and make me what he wants to make me, to change me into one of his. I'm asking you today to peel the layers off of the masks I've made over the years and to save me, save the real me, and help me get through this. I know that there's a lot coming down the road, but I want to be preserved in eternity. So today, I give my life to you, and all that that means, make me yours today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. How'd it sound?